gentlemen, it is great to be back in Las Vegas. And if we had been here 40 years ago when I started my career as a wireless networking engineer, and we had bet $1 that I would end my career as a chief AI officer, we'd all be billionaires going to Tahiti instead of here. So anyway, but besides beating the odds, you know, what it really highlights is how fast this industry is changing and how important AI is becoming to the industry. You know, you look over our careers, how fast things have changed that I'm now a chief AI officer at Juniper. Uh, you know, for me personally, the missed AI adventure started around 2011 when I was at Cisco. That's when I saw Watson play Jeopardy, right? And that's when we saw Watson beat those Jeopardy championships. And that's when I realized, you know, if they could build something that can play Jeopardy, we should be able to build something that plays networking Jeopardy, right? And that's when the adventure started. And you look at what we're seeing AI touch all aspects of society, right? AI is going to be on par with the industrial revolution, the internet. It's going to touch all aspects of things that we work with. You know, if you look what's happening in healthcare, AI is becoming a necessity for helping diagnose cancer, right? You're going to want your doctor to be using AI when you're in there visiting him. If you look what's happening in our farming industry, right? They're building AI now that can identify each weed and just apply the right pesticide to each weed. You know, this is going to like double or triple the production of our agriculture industry. You know, and when you look at what's happening with cars, you know, I would also predict in our lifetime, it will be illegal to drive a car. You know, these autonomous vehicles will get so safe, you know, that driving will be outlawed. And finally, you know, we all saw ChatGPT. You know, we're starting to see this technology transfer become even more transformational. I personally like to thank, I send OpenAI Christmas card. You know, they've reduced the number of skeptics. When I started this five years ago, I would tell you over half the room would be AI skeptics. That has gone significantly down. You know, in the networking space, you know, when Sujay and I left Cisco in 2014, what we realized was it was going to require a new architecture to build cloud AI. It was going to require a blank sheet of paper when we, when we left Cisco to start this adventure, right? And when we started the adventure, we started the adventure with the wireless access point. It's not because we thought the industry needed another access point. Uh, be honest, most of you guys thought we were crazy. Tom was one of them. He's like, why are you guys starting another wireless access point? But they didn't realize we really had a different vision. The vision was basically to solve this paradigm shift going from managing network elements to one of managing the cloud. We still have to keep all those network elements green, right? We still got to make sure I'm green. But the real paradigm shift, and we heard this from you when we were there at Cisco, was customers were tired of controllers from crashing, right? Before they were gonna put any business critical app on that network, they wanted those controllers to stop crashing. They wanted them to transform faster, right? They didn't wanna to have to wait a year for an update. They wanted to be able to keep up their digital transformation. They want things to happen in the order of weeks. But most importantly, they wanted to make sure that that user was gonna have a great experience when they put that app or that application on the network. And we started that journey with the wireless piece because when we were trying to answer the question of why are you having a poor internet experience, the access layer has about 80% of the information you need to answer that question. And we built those access points to basically move telemetry back to the cloud. And so that's where we started the adventure. Since we've joined Juniper now, you've seen us basically extend Marvis and AI ops across the wireless AP, to the switch and to the route. You know, the AP brought all that connectivity information. The router, that SD-WAN router, brings all the applications, starts to help us answer questions about the applications. And what we just announced last week, a week or two ago at Mobility Field Day, is something we call continuous learning. You know, when you're in the data science business, you talk to data scientists, label data is gold. It is very hard to get good label data. You know, what we're doing with these cloud applications like Zoom and Teams now is basically getting label data from that user experience application. They know when you're having a bad experience. 
You know, and with that label data now, we can join it with network feature data and actually build models that can accurately predict your Zoom team's performance. And once you can do that, you can now start to explain why you're having bad teams. So that is where AI and deep learning is starting to transfer, transform what we're doing in the networking space. Now, as I said, we started the journey with the data. You know, if you look at the access point that I built 20 years ago at Airspace, that access point was sending data back to the controller every minute, every two minutes. It was sending it back synchronous. You know, the reason we built the access point was because I really did not trust Cisco and Aruba to give me the data I needed to answer that question. So when you look at the data side, that is where we're starting to get user state. In addition to that synchronous data, we're starting to get asynchronous data, right? Every time that user state changes, I want that access point to send me back a state. I want to know that user state when it changes. And the next big part of this puzzle was really what we call these AI-driven primitives, was what we found out from, from you, AI aside, was you wanted the cloud, just getting the data to the cloud. And that took us about a year. You know, Randy got the data built, you know, got the network built, and then we had to spend a year trying to figure out why the support team was still SSHing into radios to solve problems, right? You know, because when you do this cloud A, you gotta get that data back to compute storage. You gotta bring the data to where the compute storage is, where you have unlimited compute storage. And the good thing about AWS and Google, we have unlimited compute storage. Uh, the only thing I have to worry about is my bill. I get a bill from those guys every month, and that still, that still limits you to some extent. But once you're there, there's no limit on what you can do with the data. And you guys appreciate that, because once you get the data there, we all have access to the same data. Everyone in the team has access to it. The next big piece of the puzzle was really around the data science. And it's really not around the algorithms, this is around the team, right? And the big thing we did inside of uh, MIS is really get our data science team next to our customer support team. Because that support team represents our customer. And then the fourth thing, the thing I'm most proud of, this is something uh, four or five years ago when I started the whole conversational interface for Sadir. You know, there was a big argument as to whether or not we really need conversational interfaces. You know, and what I firmly believed was in the industry, we all started our careers with CLI. We were all CLI jockeys 20 years ago, very proud of it. And then we slowly went to dashboards and it made your life a little bit simpler. The next big transmission, you know, transition in the user interface is gonna be around these CLs, uh, these LLMs in CI. You know, you are gonna be talking to your network like we see on Star Trek. That is gonna be the next big transition that's gonna make life easier for IT to actually start troubleshooting networks. And finally, Sadir's favorite is actions. At the end of the day, uh, I don't care, I don't need to know why there's a problem, I just need you to fix it. If you know why there's a problem, just go ahead and fix it and not bother me anymore. And then finally, if you look at the key components of Marvis, you know, we started with the VNA. That was our conversational interface. That's where we started the journey four years ago. You saw that with NLU. You know, what you're gonna see us start doing is start basically integrating LLM into that conversational interface. We've always had the natural language understanding piece of the puzzle. The next piece of puzzle is to start to generate answers that sounds like a human. And that's what LLM is starting to bring to the party, is that natural language generation part that starts to bring your network to life. The action framework is a self-driving piece. This is the piece where you want your network to start taking actions. And this is really gonna become on an element of trust. Right, this is the piece of the puzzle where you have to, we have to earn your trust. Right, we have to earn your trust as an AI assistant. And I always tell people, I don't care if you're a virtual assistant or a real person, most IT people are not gonna let you touch the knobs on their network until you've earned their trust somehow. They've got, you've gotta make sure that you trust that virtual assistant to actually twist the knobs or make a change in your network. And the third, third piece that we're adding, and this is a new fundamental leg in the Marvis adventure, is this continuous learning feedback. This is where we're starting to bring label data back from your cloud apps. Now, 
People ask me AI, ML. Uh, for me, AI is not an algorithm. AI is a concept, right? And it's really the next step in the evolution of automation. You know, what we're doing with AI is really building solutions that can do tasks on par with human domain experts, right? We're building solutions that typically require cognitive skills. You know, we've all built automation that basically automates some deployment, configuration. Uh, those are very basic scripts. The next step is really doing something that typically would require a human to do. And if you look what's going on under the hood of Marvis, I usually break it into two sets of algorithms. You know, we have kind of these regression ML. This is what we've been doing for decades. They've been around for decades. You know, what really changed in 2014 was the addition of these deep learning networks. You know, and interestingly, if you look at Google, you know, if you look at the Google search statistics on AI ML, it is in 2014 when AI went from mostly a research topic to a reality. 2014 is when we saw kind of that perfect storm of compute storage, low cost cloud storage getting good. We saw TensorFlow and all the tool sets needed to build these things become real. You know, that was the year when things started to come together for AI. And these deep learning algorithms, these are the ones that are disrupting the industries. ChatGPT, that was transformer, right? That's all the transformer technology that came out in 2017 from Google. LSTM are the deep learning algorithms that are allowing us to do anomaly detection now with very low false positives. Kind of a very basic networking capability we all talk about that have never really achieved because there's always too much noise coming out of those things, waking you up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And then what we're talking about now is Shapley. For those who have not heard about Shapley, this is basically a technique that lets you make these AI models explainable, lets you understand what features are really driving a prediction. And I think the other quick thing, and you're going to hear Randy come up and talk a little bit about this more, was in addition to having to build a whole new cloud infrastructure, right, that had the microservices architecture, had the pipelines when we wanted to build real-time data processing. And, and Sujay will quite quietly remind me, Bob, when we started this, we really weren't talking about AI. Back then, we were really talking about trying to build an architecture that could do day two operations and process data in real time. Now, it turns out that is the foundation you need if you want to do AI. You have to build cloud infrastructure that can process data in real time. But more importantly, you know, the need for the blank sheet of paper was around organization, right? In addition to having to get all of this technical stuff done and built, we had to basically get the domain, the data science team, tied to the support team. Those are your domain experts. You know, and if you look at our cloud support team, what you notice is the MIS support team is, represents you. Right? We all have access to the same data in the cloud. The customer, the support team, the data science team. You know, and the data science team's mission in life is to keep the support team happy. The fewer tickets that that support team sees is the fewer tickets that you guys are sending our way. Right? And that is the key. And I will tell people that you know, if you talk to an infrastructure vendor, if their support team is not using their own AI ops tool, they have not started the journey. Because this journey starts with making sure your data science and your domain experts are tied to the hip. And that's another thing that's very hard to do in a large organization like Cisco and Aruba. It's hard to organizationally change those type of things. And I always tell people, if you want to look for architectural change in an industry, if you see Cisco try to get three different BUs to work together, you know something's up. That is a sign that something's changing. So, <laughs> Keep an eye out for that. Now, this is what I've been talking about. I'll go a little bit deeper on this. If you look what's fundamentally happening here, we're now getting labeled data from your Zoom and Teams. We're taking that labeled data, we're joining it to the network features. And now we're building models that can predict 
the audio latency, the video latency, and really the performance of your Zoom Teams experience. Now, once you have a model that can actually predict something accurately, the magical thing called the Shapley is now we can explain to you what feature is causing that performance. So when you have a latency, if the average latency is 100 and your CEO has an average latency of 150, we can now explain, you know, is it the wireless? Is it the client? Or is it the WAN? Who actually contributed to that latency problem? So that's the, the power of these deep learning models that are going to be transforming how we solve and troubleshoot and manage networks going forward. The other big piece of this is really around natural language. What we've done to date, you know, in your current Marvis interface is we have Rasa and NLU there. So we do a very good job of understanding your intent, but we've never done a really good job of basically giving you an answer that sounds like a human wrote it. You know, and that's going to be our first step on the journey to LLM. We're going to integrate LLM into Marvis, starting with knowledge-based questions. You know, our goal is to get Marvis to the point that it can actually pass a networking certification test. So you'll basically have a network certified engineer by your side helping you troubleshoot things. The next step in this adventure is to put this on top of your database, you know, where we actually translate text to SQL. So you can now start talking to your network like you would talk to a Star Trek computer. You know, so this is my other thing. You know, all the, all the Star, how many Star Trek fans do we have in the crowd? You know, okay, talking computers, that technology is about to become real. We are down to the teleporter. The only thing left will be getting this teleproblem solved. The talking computer is within our lifetime, or within my lifetime. Maybe, maybe, maybe shortly, shortly here. <laughs> okay, with that, I'm going to invite Sadir back up. Partner in Crime is going to take you through reality and get us off some PowerPoint. Awesome. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much.